And now to Big Pharma. GlaxoSmithKline has been in the news recently and making a good fist of snatching some moral high ground. Last week, global chief executive Sir Andrew Whitty took on British and European governments over drug access and here in Australia, he addressed Parliament this week on what big drug companies are doing to fight disease and how GSK is lifting the veil on payment to Australian healthcare providers. I spoke to him from Canberra. Sir Andrew Whitty, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. Well, you set the cat amongst the pigeons a bit uh, in London before you left, accusing the British government of delaying new cancer drugs to save money. Is this austerity at, the, at work? Because the ministers have denied this, haven't they? Well, I think the point I was trying to make was if we look across Europe uh, in many, many different countries, obviously there's a lot of pressure to try and reduce prices. And we are seeing in a variety of countries some delays in introduction and particularly the reimbursement of medicines. Um, oncology is a particular area and over the last several years in the UK we've seen delays in some of those introductions. You know, one of the things which uh, I'm optimistic about in the UK is the opportunity over the next couple of years where we're negotiating a new approach to pricing and I think within that there could be a real chance to make a further improvement here. Now, payments to healthcare professionals, uh, things like sponsorships as, as well, GSK is taking a lead in disclosing in Australia. I think it was $2.2 million in 2011. Why are you doing this? Well, around the world, we're committed to transparency in everything we do. So whether that's in the kind of clinical research we do, the results of our trials, or as you rightly say, in any payments we make to healthcare practitioners, we are publishing that information. And I'm very pleased that we were able to do it here in Australia. What I think it does is just start to bust the myths. I think there's a lot of people who have suspicions uh, of the drug industry um, are many times not based on facts but based on the lack of any information at all and, and not surprisingly people are suspicious and I think what we're able to do by really shining a light on all of this is to say actually there's nothing here to be suspicious about these are all things that are absolutely legitimate they help the company do a better job of developing better medicines and vaccines and it's all above board. Well, it's no secret that the cynicism about big drug companies being transparent when it suits them. Um, and I was wondering whether this wasn't an easier area to be transparent in. I mean, it took GSK, for example, over a decade to admit that its antidepressant peroxetine had addictive qualities. And then there was the Ribena vitamin C uh, case in New Zealand. Uh, you've all had your issues. Well, I think that the uh, reality is we're looking at all of the areas that we're engaged in to try and maximise the level of confidence and trust that any commentator or patient can have in the company. I think what you're really seeing is a company which over the last three or four years has really uh, strived to learn, uh, to try and change the way we operate. And, and I can assure you that it's across the board and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about transparency of working practices, whether you're talking about how we can get more drugs and vaccines available to the poor in Africa, uh, or whether it's how we respond to safety concerns and making sure that we, uh, we are moving as quickly as we absolutely possibly can to make the right decisions. Finding a balance between access to medicines and profits, I know, is something that you feel very passionately about. And you chair with Bill Gates the initiative to eradicate 10 neglected diseases. But what is the secret of doing this in, and getting 13 of the world's big drug companies who are intensely in, uh, competitive and profit-oriented and be able to deliver this? Well, I, it's a great question and, and uh, what we were able to do over the last several years was to start to challenge some of the dogma about why this couldn't be achieved. Over the last couple of years we've been working quietly uh, with Bill Gates, others, the WHO, other drug companies to really say, look, as an industry uh, we, we have a chance here not to do just one disease and not to take 20 years, but to maybe do 10 and only take seven or eight years to make it happen. We, we figured out how to do this. We have the drugs, but what we needed was more companies to step up and make generous, open-ended commitments to really allow the aid agencies to do their job, knowing that they wouldn't be cut back after a few months or a couple of years. And I think we can honestly look back over the last three or four years 
as a period of remarkable progress in opening up access to medicines and vaccines, particularly in Africa and the least developed countries. Back in Australia, April the 1st is a very big day for all our pharmacies, with an average drop of 23% in prices of 200 drugs on the PBS. How is that going to affect GlaxoSmithKline? Well, of course, that's going to have a negative impact on our turnover. We're ready for it. Um, it's all we recognise, and again, it's really a sense of partnership and balance with the government. We all understand the challenges that the Australian government are dealing with in terms of deficit reduction. And it's not surprising to me that the, the drug bill and the industry is being looked at to contribute toward it. And I think that the industry and the government have had a sensible, uh, very mature agreement. And I'd much prefer to have these, um, if you will, multi-year uh, agreements than having a crisis every three months while we try and figure out the next step. So while this is quite a painful thing, uh, it's something we understand. We understand the context of it. And, and I'm not unhappy that the price reductions hit the older products. I think it's absolutely fair that once the companies have received their reward for innovation in the early years of the medicine being available, that eventually uh, the prices come down. It, they ought to come down. Uh, what's critical is as we go forward over the next few years that we make sure that we keep that incentive for innovation so that the new medicines and vaccines do come along folks in Australia do get access to those breakthroughs and then they themselves of course will one day become old and then those prices should come down. Sir Andrew Whitty, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.